Good Lord, there's really nothing to talk about this week. I mean, nothing that I care about. This is the Enough Already podcast. My name is Fingers Malloy. Tracy L. Connors joins me, and that's a great tease for a show, Tracy. Of course. But Well, we're going to bore the hell out of you for the next hour. <laughs> well, we're going to try to make uh, what happened over the last week exciting, but quite honestly, I, I don't know, Tracy... Uh, when it comes to this impeachment uh, hearing circus that's going on in the House right now, uh, if anyone is paying attention other than the people who are emotionally invested in impeachment. I mean, if you look at the television ratings, it's about 13 to 12, 12 to 13 million people watch the first day. Mm-hmm. That ain't. So government sweeps week is not going well. <laughs> no, no. Is what you're not. saying. Uh, right. And they got to imagine how many stay at home moms or, you know, unemployed people as well that watch daytime television are getting annoyed that their shows are being interrupted because I guess they were carrying this on the networks. Well, here's the interesting thing uh, about the hearings, at least uh, like I freely admit that. Uh, I watched highlights. I wasn't going to spend my my day watching all of this, uh, but I did catch some of the highlights. Uh, from what I understand, day one of the hearings, uh, all the networks, all the major news networks, uh, they, they covered it live. Mm-hmm. That's my understanding as well. And then day one was such a dud that none of them carried the whole thing live on day two. It was only CNN, uh, which oh. I, I like to call oh. CNN pack now. They canceled the, the program that fast. I got yeah. one episode and then they canned it. It was like the uh, the rosy. Uh, what was that? Uh, the little uh, variety show that Rosie had for like a week and then they, they canceled it. That's what the government sweeps week uh, show. The impeachment hearing extravaganza. Yeah, it was one day and they were done when Jim Jordan got up there and said, you're you're their star witness. to to what's his face i don't even have enough respect for the guy to know his name like wait wait you're 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 their star witness i mean they they've got people on tape saying we don't think he committed a crime i'm not aware of any crime that he committed and and everybody on the on the right in in the room is looking around why are we even here right (laughs) what are we doing Uh, apparently uh (laughs) High crimes, uh, what's the the saying? God, I'm so tired. High crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, Is uh, orange man bad? We don't like the feller. Is the new standard. Yes, I think that's the Latin. (laughs) Well, speaking of the Latin, you know, they've had to drop quid pro quo. Right. Because people don't know what that means. Right. Well, on top of it, there was no quid pro quo. But... uh, Again, I and I've said this many times on the show, I wish I would have invested in that goalpost moving company back in 2016. I would have made a fortune by now because if we were going to have these this impeachment inquiry, uh, if we were going to have these hearings, where's uh, anything from the Mueller report, Tracy? I thought this was we were going to he was going to be taken from office. He's going to be impeached because of collusion with Russia. And then that didn't work out. Now it's it's the the Ukraine uh stuff and uh, this is turning out to be a dud i i don't know what they can come up with next i mean we all know what's going to happen here the the house will will most likely vote for impeachment and then there will be no conviction in the senate and we'll just go into uh election season uh after doing all this uh completely wasting everyone's time well to me this is a couple things one this is a freeway for the dnc to get oppo research done and take hits on Trump without having to spend any money on advertising. But at the same time, they're not getting the audience they want. So that kind of sucks (laughs) and it'll backfire on them. And then with the senators that are running for president, what are they going to do? If I'm Mitch McConnell, I'm dragging this out as long as possible when it gets to the Senate. Cause I agree. I think they're going to find something to get enough Democrats to vote for and have articles of impeachment. Um, but then the Senate becomes the jury for the trial that will be held in the Senate. 
they may have to be there six days a week. <laughs> what? So that gives a huge advantage to everybody that's not a senator. So Biden and uh, Buttigieg, who's climbing up in the polls, and Andrew Yang, of course, and maybe Bloomberg, who's still playing with getting in. And now we're hearing Deval Patrick might get in. Those guys can be running around all over the country campaigning. And the what Iowa's the first primary is of February. Yes. Yeah. So drag this out as long as you want to <laughs> would be my game. Let's keep playing this. We'll keep all of you on the bench. See how you like it. Can you imagine how big of a camera time horror Elizabeth Warren is going to be during this whole process? I mean, she well, has don't... to be in D.C. I mean, they'll run out every day after the hearings are over and run their mouths. But right. it's boring. You know, if you've got in that group that's, you know, as long as nobody drops out between now and when this gets started, you've got Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and uh, Cory Booker, and Amy Klobuchar. Right. Who do you think is going to get the most mic time? Well, obviously, it's going to be Elizabeth Warren. I mean, you think so? oh, well, you, you can't make the argument for Bernie Sanders because, listen, this, the networks, especially CNN, made Bernie Sanders their bitch back in 2016. This is true. And since CNN seems to be the only one who wants to do wall to wall coverage of this crap other than MSNBC, uh, CNN really made Bernie Sanders their bitch. Yeah. Do you think they've totally given up on Kamala Harris? Yes. OK, I, th I think uh, Tulsi Gabbard took her out at the knees and she's never been able to recover. And uh, you're even seeing Tulsi Gabbard complaining uh, publicly that. People, uh, networks like MSNBC want Elizabeth Warren to be the nominee uh, because of the, the favoritism that they seem to be playing. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, this new debate, the latest debate coming up. Um, you have details on uh, how it's going to be structured, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how much camera time uh, each candidate gets you know it'll be monopolized for the most part by bernie sanders joe biden and elizabeth warren and everyone else biting at their heels trying to 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 horn in on on the big three but i found what i found interesting about the the piece that you found tracy over at vox is that boy they they really in the first couple paragraphs they have to make it known it'll be an all-female panel questioning <laughs> yeah the candidates Yes. So this debate is being uh, hosted by MSNBC and The Washington Post, Ooh. and it will feature a slightly smaller slate of candidates and will be the crucial opportunity for top tier contenders to further establish themselves as the primary uh, early primaries approach. This is all according to Vox. So they love this. Where was the all female thing? I thought it was the first paragraph. I thought too. Oh, it's a second paragraph, first sentence. The debate is expected expected to air on MSNBC. <laughs> We're not sure. <laughs> They're hosting the debate. <laughs> the debate is expected to air on MSNBC and Radio 1 and live stream on MSNBC.com and WashingtonPost.com. It will be moderated by an all-female panel of journalists. How exciting. So we're calling Rachel Maddow a journalist now? I guess. And it's going to be hosted at filmmaker Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta, Fingers. How exciting is that? Tyler Perry, that's the the the, the, the movie guy, isn't it? That you're, mm -hmm. oh, Lord, what's the does like the ninety characters in one yeah. in one Medea, movie? That whole deal. Yeah. How exciting. Yeah, I know it's thrilling. <laughs> So anyway, they've only got 10 in this one. So our uh, contenders are going to be Biden, Warren, Sanders, Harris, Booker, Buttigieg, Yang. Tom Steyer made the cut. Uh -huh. <laughs> so who knows how much money he had to spend on Facebook ads to get into this one. Uh, Amy Klobuchar and Tulsi Gabbard. So that's going to be interesting. Although, to go back to impeachment for just a moment, I think the other thing that stands out to me, I, th I think I've said this on the show before, referring to the other debates, that their game plan seems to make America bored again. Right. And that's what they're doing with this impeachment thing. I mean, this is so dry. 
my God, I was expecting something entertaining. I put on C-SPAN radio at work and I'm just like, I, I want to fall asleep at my desk and I can't afford to do that. So I have to just tune out. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it just reminds me too of. Do you remember the killer's first single? Somebody told me. No. Or the the chorus is somebody told me that you had a boyfriend who looked like a girlfriend that I had in February of last year. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> That's what this whole story is about. I heard from that guy who heard it from the other guy that they think that they overheard X Y Z going on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Tell me more. Right. It's it feels like the whole investigation that was done in the in the basement of the Capitol was nothing more than uh it, it was it was like a, a a bunch of teenage girls at a sleepover. It's like, oh my God, did you hear what Jim said about Kelly? And oh my God, I, I, I wonder if they played light as a feather, stiff as a board while they were doing the investigation. It was so teenager-esque. It's nothing but rumor and innuendo and apparently that's good now. Any, anything to get Orange Man bad out of the White House. And I was just thinking, do you think they said Candyman three times into the mirror? And <laughs> their version of that is saying Orange Man bad three times into the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> they make a new witness that pops forward that remembers overhearing something that could be damaging. But I... it, this is bad for them. It's not entertaining. It's bad TV. It's hard to follow, especially when you get into all these foreign names it's hard to keep track of everybody and right. so i think people just tune out right like i thought there would be awesome if there was an app that you could take say a russian novel and just switch all the names to being like joe matt bob <laughs> you know lisa things that you can okay i remember this you just see a whole bunch of consonants together and your mind just goes blank and you can't keep track of who's who in those stories and that's kind of what this seems like to me yeah uh it, it uh, NBC complained that it wasn't entertaining enough. <laughs> I, I can't remember the exact wording, but uh, there's no sizzle, there's no pizzazz to these hearings or something like that. I can't. Uh, the uh, exact wording escapes me that NBC News uh, described it as, but it uh, to me, when you don't have anything. This this is the best that they had to uh, lay out to the American people to make the case for impeachment. Uh, it's been a dud. And then you look at these debates, and you know there there are people in the Democratic Party who are are really worried that there isn't a candidate in the current field of uh, fifty on the Democratic side. Um, who really ex will excite anyone. So it's the whole thing between the impeachment process and their uh, nominating process. It's just a big snooze fest. This is what I'm telling you. It's make America bored again. <laughs> and the other thing they seem to be going after is they want to overturn the idea that uh, my facts don't care about your feelings. This is just a big feels fest. Oh, my, I was so hurt. You know, I, I'm, this was the most exciting minute to me. It was when Trump tweeted about <laughs> what a shit show Yovanovitch's career has been. Like, everywhere she's gone, things have fallen apart. And he tweets this while she's up there, and then Schiff has to dramatically read it to her and then be like, how does that make you feel? <laughs> and I guess she cr had apparently cried in the closed-door testimony. But I think that she kept from crying on the main stage, mm -hmm. which is probably good for every one of the female presidential nominees. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, oh, this lady, you know, she's she's been in some of the scariest places on earth and stood up to all these people, but she's going to sit and cry because of what she heard about a phone call with President Trump. And then she was summoned home. Get the hell out of there. You're bad. And, you know, there's another phone call between... No, it's the same phone call between Trump and Zelensky where he referred to her as the woman. And I'm supposed to be scandalized by this. <laughs> oh, my God, how sexist. He called her the woman. He didn't call her the ugly woman or the, you know, like there was no modifier to that. Is this incorrect? Does she not identify as such? Is that what the problem oh, is? Oh, that's probably what it is. He didn't, uh, he didn't say the broad or the skirt, did he? <laughs> the dame no <laughs> the woman the woman
And nobody, he didn't like her and Zelensky didn't like her. Okay. It's probably a bad deal if the president of the country that you're the ambassador for doesn't like you. <laughs> if diplomacy is being likable, isn't it? Or part of it should be, I would think. Well, and again, the, the Ukrainians have come out and said that they didn't think there was any kind of quid pro quo. So th that should be the end of it. And right. Then, oh, he, he wanted him to go and make a public statement about this. And he was scheduled to do an interview with CNN and then he didn't do the interview. OK, so there was never a public statement made <laughs> and the aid was released. What's the problem here? I don't know, but it. And uh... tell me, how how do these people think like sanctions aren't a quid pro quo? Well, but you don't normally put sanctions on a country due to uh, what what people believe as a uh, a beef with a political party or getting information oppo research on a political opponent. It's usually to strong arm <laughs> them to uh, go along with U.S. interests. Okay, what's the difference? We allow it sometimes, but not other times. I hear you, but I, I, I can understand where people would be upset if uh, the, the president of the United States uh, is making foreign policy decisions based on uh, trying to get oppo research on a political opponent, a political rival. But I... <laughs> You know, it's one thing just kind of casually mention something in a conversation. It's another thing to uh, make it out to be something that it isn't. And the if the Ukrainians weren't even really aware of all this, that this again, another theory, you may as well say uh, that uh, not only did uh, the president want the Ukrainians to uh, do, you know, uh, commit to an investigation into Hunter Biden, but they also wanted uh, Trump also wanted the Ukrainians to hire hookers to pee on another bed that Barack Obama <laughs> slept in. I mean, it's <laughs> the, the the leaps that these people make when it comes to Trump. It's just it simply amazes me. Uh, but I go back to I I feel bad for I, I genuinely feel bad for leftists who bought the Russian thing hook, line, and sinker and uh, were, were, they were lied to repeatedly by Democrats, by the corporate media. And you, you would think they would, it would be fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. But now it, it's so many of them are, are now jumping headfirst into this Ukrainian business. It's like, how many times are you going to fall for this? I, I know you're desperate to get Orange Man bad out of the White House, but well, focus on the election and get him out. Look at them like a doomsday cult, right? They've been prophesizing the end of Orange Man, and we had a date set. Yeah. <laughs> how many times? <laughs> And it was going to be this method of uh, execution and then this one and then that one. And then when you remember when the Mueller report came out and it was a dud and then he testified and that was even worse. They came out of those hearings, the Democrats saying he just provided us with a roadmap for impeachment. Um, I don't remember Ukraine being a checkpoint on that roadmap. Do you fingers? Uh, no. Uh, but, uh, Check that right out. <laughs> that was map quest. Ah, that's old. We've got... <laughs> Apple Maps has now updated itself, so we've got a whole new trajectory to follow. Well, the other thing that's comical about this is you have people like Nancy Pelosi making statements like, we're doing this with a heavy heart. <laughs> yeah, right, like you have a heart. <laughs> right? <laughs> we don't really uh, want to do this, Tracy, but we feel like we have to. Shit. No. You guys have been on, uh, apparently you've had a heavy heart now for three years because you were talking about impeaching the cat before he even took the oath of office. <laughs> oh, man. See, it's much more entertaining, I think, when you and I talk about it than actually having to try to watch the damn thing. <laughs> I, honestly, can you... I just can't imagine being a talking head at CNN... And going into work thinking, okay, uh, how am I going to have to make this sell? 
How am I going to sell this to uh, Joe Sixpack in Wisconsin? That this, all this stuff that's being said uh, in these hearings, it, it really matters, and the president should be impeached. Once, I, I would, I would have a much more respect for Democrats if they just. Uh, held a vote and said, hey, you know what? We really don't have anything on him. Uh, we just feel like it's dangerous that he's the president of the United States and uh, we don't feel like he's qualified to be president. I, I would have much more respect for him doing going down that road than coming up with all these this conspiracy bullshit. I mean, if this were the kind of th- this is the kind of stuff that if the right were doing it, people would be accusing them of channeling their inner info wars. Mm hmm. But this is not being done by some fringe element, you know, is what at, you know, how they consider Alex Jones to be. This is mainstream, like you said, corporate press. It's just everywhere. But now they've turned into the fringe element. Yes, but they aren't fringe because they're mainstream. At the, like, can you have a fringe that is mainstream? Yes. Okay. It, it, it goes I back get to, to people watching this, I guess. Don't you think that the conspiracy theories that they have been spinning for the past two and a half years are borderline ridiculous and the kind of stuff that you would consider if it, if it weren't uh, CNN or MSNBC or the New York Times um, covering this president that you would say this sounds like fringe shit? Oh, 100%. So it's fringe. Let's call it what it is. I mean, it, it's it's the argument like you've made on several occasions uh, when people uh, are upset with Trump if he does something and they say, oh, this isn't presidential. Well, if the president's doing it, it's, it's therefore presidential, correct? <laughs> exactly. So I don't care if you're corporate media or if you're info wars, if you're acting uh, – if you're reporting in a way it makes you look like you're part of the fringe, well, then you're the fringe. You've redefined yourself. Fair enough. So we should call them the fringe media now? Okay. All right. I can get behind that. But if they just... I, I, I've said on several occasions, I would like to be able to vote for a Democrat. I, re- I know. I really would. Uh, Heart. <laughs> <laughs> but this is all batshit crazy stuff it is and the funny thing is this this cat isn't a conservative he's just a deal maker and if he's a new york freaking republican if they would have gone in uh in 2017 and said okay look uh we're really pissed off that hillary lost uh but Let's deal with this guy. They could have gotten so much of their agenda passed because Trump would have been president. Trump just wants to make a deal. Uh, he wants the signing ceremony. He wants everyone to love him. And it would have taken a lot for Republicans to push back against President Trump's agenda because of his popularity within the base. So if he if Democrats would have gone in with uh, with the attitude that we can make deals with this guy, they probably would have been further ahead, but they're so blinded by hatred and have such a quest, a thirst for political power that it just wasn't possible. Well, I also think they don't want to give up the credit for that. It would be, you know, President Trump got this done. Say they get their big infrastructure bill that we we're always hearing about, fix all our crumbling roads and bridges. Right. They would have to cede that to Trump. And they don't like doing that. They like being the party of Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and all these kind of things. That's a legacy for them. It's true. And it, that goes to show just how really ridiculous this whole system is. <laughs> you think? And and how people uh, don't really it, – it, this isn't just – I used to think this was just tribal – uh, among the voters that, you know, oh, my my granddaddy was a Democrat and my daddy was a Democrat and I'm going to be a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> this whole notion that people uh, get voted into office and they're going to go to Washington, D.C. to get things done, it's it's all horse shit. They go, <laughs> they go to Washington um, and once they get there, it uh, doesn't matter what they say on the campaign trail. It's uh, they do what leadership tells them to do. 
Yep. And they don't give a damn about any of us. Right. It, it's all about the acquisition of political power. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the acquisition of political power, we've got these, uh, this debate coming up. And uh, who do you think is the next to fall? Who drops out next? Out of the let's forget about the the people who won't even qualify for this debate. You mentioned the candidates earlier. Uh, is Cory Booker going to be in this much longer? Is Kamala Harris? Kamala Harris, I guess, has slashed campaign staff in New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, her campaign is treading water. Uh, it makes you wonder after this debate how much longer some of these candidates who are polling at one and two percent will go if, they, if they're just committed to at least getting through iowa before dropping out and hoping that something will happen and they'll regain some momentum or get momentum um but who, who do you think is going to be the next to drop i i think it might be camilla yeah. just seeing stories this week about her campaign cracking up and they're having problems with it i guess her sister's running her campaign stop it no, I read about it in Politico this morning. Let me see if I can find it again. Her sister's running her campaign? Yeah. She's in charge of it. Is her sister even a politician? Or has have a, has any kind of political experience or experience running a campaign? Or has it gotten to the point where she's just circling the wagons and she's... Uh, found someone who she she can trust who she doesn't have to pay very much i don't know i didn't get that far because i was bored <laughs> it, i'm telling you <laughs> her campaign chair is her sister okay so this is uh here we go let me pull this up on the big screen over here so the politico this came out a couple days ago the headline is no discipline no plan no strategy kamala harris's campaign in meltdown <laughs> oh so the, the subhead is uh, campaign manager juan rodriguez is taking most of the heat for the failings but his defenders point their finger at the candidate's sister maya harris so <laughs> kamala harris's campaign is careening toward a crack up that's a pretty decent semi-alliteration there <laughs> Good job. Uh, as the California senator crisscrosses the country trying to revive her sputtering presidential bid, aides at her fast-shrinking headquarters are deep into the finger-pointing stages, and much of the blame is being placed on campaign manager Juan Rodriguez. After Rodriguez announced dozens of layoffs and redeployments in late October to stem overspending, three more staffers at headquarters here were let go, and another quit in recent days, aides told Politico. Officials said they've become increasingly frustrated at the campaign chief's lack of clarity about what changes have been made to right the ship and his plans to turn the situation around. They hold Rodriguez responsible for questionable budget decisions, including continuing to bring on new hires shortly before the layoffs began. Nah. <laughs> That's a bad look, huh? Right. Hey, we've got this whole new great team that we're spending big money on. Uh, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired. <laughs> Fired. We're gonna slash her. <laughs> it's like Oprah in reverse. Instead of you get a car, you get a car. It's you get a pink slip, and you get a pink slip. <laughs> oh man, I love this. So okay, so amid the turmoil, some aides have gone directly to campaign chair Maya Harris, the candidate's sister, and argued that Rodriguez needs to be replaced if Harris has any hope of a turnaround, according to two officials. It's a campaign of id said one senior Harris official, laying much of the blame on Rodriguez, but also pointing to a leaderless structure at the top that's been allowed to flail without accountability. That's basically all you need to know about Kamala Harris and her campaign. How about instead of blaming the campaign manager, why don't you blame the shitty candidate? Right? With that seems like an obvious choice. You know, with an awful track record in California, uh, how she even has a political career and how she rose to her prominence in California Democratic Party is a shitty story. She's a shitty candidate. She's phony as a $3 bill. And look at the, the one thing that she tried to bring up in the last debate that would set her apart from all of her other <laughs> opponents is banning Donald Trump from Twitter. 
That's her big idea. Wow. It's big, bold ideas out there. This is the counsel that she receives from her cracked staff. I, I got to tell you, Tracy, uh, may, may I speak for, may I be the spokesman for uh, Middle America for a minute? Please. Uh, I talked to the folks, Bill O'Reilly calls them the folks. And I got to tell you, in casual conversations uh, over ham and eggs at a diner to uh, a coffee shop in the morning uh, on my way to work, people cannot stop talking about how they want Donald Trump banned from Twitter. And their lives will be made so much better if they could only ban Donald Trump from Twitter. this is the ridiculous shit that Kamala Harris's campaign is coming up with. At a you, you, you only get if you're in Kamala Harris's position, you get three or four minutes in a debate. If you're lucky, maybe six. And you're you're spending the fact that you're spending five seconds of that time on banning Donald Trump from Twitter just shows you what a shitty candidate she is to begin with. Well, that was all a media play because she had announced that on Twitter, I believe, prior to the debate and started some petition or something. And then she gets to make the rounds on the news networks because they're all thrilled. Oh, great. We can have this fringe idea come to the fringe media and we can talk about it because they all want him thrown off, too. It's his only way to get his message out because they won't cover it correctly. Right. But I think they also believe, oh, it could be his downfall now. That's why they're reading tweets during these silly impeachment hearings. It it would be it would be nice if he were a little bit more disciplined on Twitter. I don't care about it at all. I think it's hilarious. Oh, I but here's the deal. Twitter isn't real. No, uh, really. I I mean so much of the media, the corporate media, the the people in the media bubble in in New York City and Washington D.C. think that Twitter is much bigger than it really is. People mm-hmm. outside of the media bubble, I'm not saying people aren't on Twitter. Obviously, they are, but they don't live and die by Twitter and, and tweets and how many people are following me and all the, the, the bullshit that, that people in the media bubble seem to care about and think that it's news. I, I, it, it's amazed me how in the last 10 years how social media has completely taken over journalism. You know, it used to be where you would have major networks, newspapers, they would create news by coming up with a stupid poll. And, and they, would, they would conduct a poll, and then they would extract whatever headlines and uh, narratives from the poll that they could get that would help propel their, uh, the, the, their narrative they're trying to push moving forward. Uh, that's how they would create news they don't have to do these polls anymore all they have to do is go to social media and say oh there was outrage on social media this week and it all it it could be a bunch of sock puppet accounts Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if they could just find eight tweets on twitter that will help push their narrative and create a story and be able to fill three minutes of cable news time with some bullshit story that goes along with their narrative it it, it, that has completely changed cable news and reporting and meanwhile most people i who i talk to outside of our little media our little media bubble they don't have a twitter account or if they're on twitter they aren't on it 24 7 like some of these people are no i pulled up while you were talking about that i i dug in because i know there was just some Um, statistics that came out about this a little while ago. So this is from, I think, September of this year. Here's the Twitter demographics. Mm -hmm. 22% of U.S. adults use Twitter. Okay. (laughs) 22%. I mean, that's more than watch the the hearing. Right. But to think that of that 22%, they're all interested in politics is wrong. Right. There's a lot of sports talk that goes on on Twitter. Absolutely. Which I understand. If there's a major sports game going on, that's what's trending. It's not political. Right. So it's just so silly that how much it dominates the political discussion. But you had a, a situation on Thursday night where a Cleveland Brown tried to murder a Pittsburgh Steeler with a, a helmet. I don't know if you saw that. 
No. Oh, at the end of the Browns Steelers game, the Browns were up 14 points with five seconds left. Uh, Miles Garrett uh, went to sack Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback. Uh, oh, I can't remember his name. And uh, he he hit him. They went to the ground. Uh, there was a little bit of a scuffle. They got up. The, this defensive end from Cleveland ripped the quarterback's helmet off his head, and the quarterback started coming after him. And the this 300-pound defensive lineman took the helmet, swung at him, and hit him in the head with it. Uh, <sighs> Miles Garrett has been suspended indefinitely by the NFL, so no, God only knows when he's going to be back. But... Uh, that was one of those situations where it, Twitter exploded, and it was all sports. <laughs> it wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't talking about uh, uh, the the impeachment inquiry or anything uh, political. It was sports, 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 sports. And I know many people, uh, many of my friends. That's the only reason why they're on Twitter. It, it's celebrity tweets, sports tweets, following their favorite teams, beat writers, so they can get information quicker about their teams than they could 15 years ago by having to get on the internet and go to a news site or open a newspaper <laughs> you know <laughs> that's that's why people are on twitter it these the notion that the you know 200 million americans are on twitter and they're only on twitter so they could fi- find out what uh jake tapper <laughs> thinks about the president, uh, or it's just it's it's laughable. But these people are in their bubbles, and they think because all of their friends are on Twitter talking politics. Well, that's 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 a reflection of what's going on in America, and it's it's not the case. No, and I think the left has put way too much emphasis on paying attention to what the heck is going on on Twitter. And it seems to be only the most hardcore partisans that spend their time on there all day long. So they're skewing who they think their base is at this point. Right. And I just never understood getting into political arguments on social media. I know you've, you've done it in the past. We have uh, friends and, and acquaintances on the right who will get into huge arguments with people on Twitter. And I'll, I'll look at, my friends following, and they'll have fifty to seventy-five thousand people following them on Twitter. Sometimes a well over a hundred thousand, and they're fighting with someone who has twenty-two people following them. What? Do you, so why are you wasting no. your time? Yeah, I stopped doing that years ago. Facebook was always way worse for me because I just couldn't help myself <laughs> from posts. I, I wouldn't try. Well, sometimes I would intentionally try to start stuff, but. If people would post things that I would see and I, I just couldn't sit on my hands and right. I would wait hours doing it. And then I would just be like, I, I don't know why I just <laughs> why I did that. So I just stay away from it now. And it's made my life much better. Well, see, that's the thing that's bad about Facebook. I've noticed when back when I would occasionally get into an argument on on Facebook, uh I would check my notifications more on Facebook than I would on Twitter because chances are on, on, on Facebook, I know the person I'm arguing with. Right, right. And I, I don't know in my mind, <laughs> I, 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 it's a ridiculous thought that, okay, because I know them, maybe there's still hope that I could change <laughs> their mind in some way. But, I mean, how many times have you gotten into an argument with a partisan on Twitter where after it was over, you said to yourself, wow, I never thought of it that right way. That person really changed my mind on this issue. It never happens. So you're no. wasting your time. Right. But people get sucked into that. And like you said, it's a waste of everybody's time. I don't see it going on as much anymore, I don't think, on Twitter. Some of the bigger people, you know, people with bigger followings might argue with each other, but the riffraff, not so much. I think a lot of it has to do with the mute button now on Mm. Twitter. I I think that people, if they get any uh, noise thrown at them from a stranger rather than responding, it's just easier to hit mute and you never have to see this person again without giving them the satisfaction of knowing that they've been blocked. Right, right. You know? 
So, but I'll be interested to see what happens at this debate. Uh, my girlfriend, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, she's the only one that's ex- exciting uh, as far as I'm concerned. And it's only. I just... Go ahead. Oh, I look like, and I know people will say, well, he thinks that way because she's hot and they're probably right. Uh, but also, I mean, look, she she Kamala Harris had some momentum in this campaign and, and Tulsi completely kneecapped her. So yeah. what's next? Who's she going to go after? Who's she going to bury next if she has the opportunity? Well, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it in the uh, show prep doc, but she's going after Hillary Clinton. And it's a smart move. It's a really smart move. I love this so much. So she put out on Twitter the other day, speaking of that cesspool of Twitter, yeah. uh, a quote from her campaign saying, presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard, U.S. Representative Hawaii, in case you weren't aware, uh, its campaign's legal counsel released the following letter today concerning Hillary Clinton's defamation of Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. And this letter is awesome so this is all about the we talked about this when it happened that hillary called her a russian asset and said she was being groomed (laughs) yes never called her out by name though so the attorneys point that out that they they have the exact quote from hillary's appearance on david pluff's campaign hq podcast where uh she says that that um I'm not making any predictions. This is her talking about the Russians, but I think they've got their eye on someone who is currently in the Democratic primary and are grooming her to be the third party candidate. She's a favorite of the Russians and they have a bunch of sites and bots and other ways of supporting her so far. And that's assuming Jill Stein will give it up, which she might not because she's also a Russian asset. Yeah, she's a Russian asset. I mean it totally. So that's verbatim Hillary. So <laughs> the uh, Tulsi's uh, legal team has now said they want her to make a full retraction. <laughs> <laughs> she for, And they point out that they tried to spin this. I don't know if you saw that where they came out and said, oh, she wasn't saying Russian. She said the Republicans, <laughs> not the Russians. So that was their game for a couple of days. So they addressed that in this letter. And then they go on to say. Uh, we demand that you immediately hold a press conference to verbally retract in full your comments. We also demand that you immediately publish this it, this full and fair retraction on Twitter, the Twitter account of at Hillary Clinton and distribute it to CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal and The Washington Post. So this is what they want Hillary to, to say <laughs> on Twitter and send out to these media um, sites. On October the 17th, 2019, I made certain statements about Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Among other things, I accused her of being a Russian asset and that Russia was promoting her to be a third party presidential candidate. I was wrong. I never should have made these remarks and I apologize. I did not have any basis for making statements. I acknowledge my grave mistake and error in judgment in this matter. I support and admire the work that Congresswoman (laughs) Gabbard has done. (laughs) And we'll continue to do so in serving our country. I love it. They end it with, I'm available to discuss. Should you have any questions? (laughs) We look forward to hearing from you soon. And we look forward to your promptly correcting the record. I think that if if Hillary Clinton really wants to troll her and people on the right, she should say, uh, I was wrong for being upset with Tulsi Gabbard. I got all of my information from uh, about her as a, a Russian asset from a YouTube video. Oh, that would be very clever. That's all I got. Uh, I think you should tweet them at her. She's like, here, <laughs> I'm secretary. I've come up with the perfect defense for you. Yeah. Blame that poor schmuck that you blame Benghazi on. Right. Came out with another video saying that Tulsi Gabbard was a Russian asset. <laughs> oh, man. What? We'll see what happens. She released a statement saying, I've seen Tulsi Gabbard's poll numbers, and at this point, what difference does it make? There you go. We're just going to drive that one into the ground. Yeah, why not? Uh, If we could pivot, Tracy, uh, you found a story that um, I think we need to get into, and it's about breathalyzers. And 
you know, I've never understood why people on the right have such a suspicion for government. I, I do understand that. Um, every government agency, you're suspicious of, of government overreach, government power. But when it comes to law enforcement, you you can't question law enforcement and their motives. Uh, I think you should question everyone's motives and question their power when they have a lot of it. Um, and this is kind of this is scary what you've uncovered regarding breathalyzer tests and how many breathalyzer um, machines aren't accurate or the people who are using them aren't properly trained. Well, does it surprise you, I guess, first off? Uh, you know, a little bit. And I, I, the reason why is because breathalyzers have been around for so long that you just... <laughs> It's just been, we've been so trained to believe that they've been around forever and they're quite accurate. Hell, uh, they, they're, they're even somewhat accurate. The, the novelty ones in a bar where you can put a quarter in and get a straw from the bar and blow into it. And blow, oh, yep, I'm drunk, <laughs> you know. Uh, but this, it. If I I would be very interested to see how many lawyers who specialize in drunk driving are able to get people off um, based on information like this that you found. Uh, you have the piece up right now. Yeah, this is I found this on the Mises Wire, and they're reporting on uh, New York Times story from this week as well. So this is the headline: is Don't trust the government with breathalyzers. And other forensic evidence. Isn't that reassuring? (laughs) So this is by Ryan McMacken. And he says that uh, thanks to the proliferation of body cameras and security cameras attached to homes and businesses, police are far more frequently being caught lying. And then he gives a bunch of examples about that kind of stuff, which is good. And I believe that on this program, I've demanded that all bureaucrats wear body cams at all times. (laughs) We can see what they're up to. (laughs) So he says... Um, But at least there are some things we know are reliable when it comes to police investigations. Those are the scientific tests conducted by prosecutors and police agencies used in forensic analysis. At least those things are done by reliable and impartial experts, right? Wrong. For example, last week, the New York Times released the results of a new study showing that so-called breathalyzer machines, long used as evidence against alleged drunk drivers, are not reliable. So they, the New York Times found that the devices, this talking about breathalyzers, I'll skip through this a little bit, devices found in virtually every police station in the United States gener- generate skewed results with alarming frequency, even though they are marketed as precise to the third decimal place. Judges in Massachusetts and New Jersey have thrown out more than 30,000 breath tests in the past 12 months alone largely because of human errors and lacks governmental oversight. Across the country, thousands of other tests have also been invalidated in recent years. So the machines are sensitive scientific instruments, and in many cases, they haven't been properly calibrated, yielding results that were at times 40% too high. Good Lord. Yeah, maintaining machines is up to the police departments and that sometimes have shoddy standards and lack expertise. So the Times interviewed more than 100 lawyers, scientists, executives, and police officers and reviewed tens of thousands of pages of court records, corporate filings, confidential emails and contracts. And together, they revealed the depth of a nationwide problem that has attracted only sporadic attention. Isn't this awesome? And then they go on later in here to talk about how um, the, this is back to Mises' own reporting on this, separate from the New York Times. They say the Colorado Bureau of Investigations admitted that at least 56 of the DUI blood tests, so this is not breathalyzers, this is when they take you to the hospital and test your blood, it conducted, which is 4% of all of their tests, in the last six months were incorrect. How, how is that possible? They must be screwing it up. It's like lax lab standards or whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know how those tests are performed. I mean, with the breathalyzer, it's pretty easy to think like you have to keep that calibrated. You know what this means? Hmm. OJ didn't do it. 
There you go. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. So he goes on to then lament, like, it's too bad these lab workers don't have to wear body cams. So he was smart and tied it all back together. But I think this is terrifying. If I were an honest cop, I would want to wear a body cam. Yes. But you'd also want to calibrate your field sobriety, or not field sobriety, because we went over this in pre-show. It's different, field sobriety versus doing a breathalyzer in the field, two different things. But if you were an honest cop, wouldn't you want to make sure that your breathalyzer was calibrated? Yes. Doesn't seem like it's that hard. Well, and, and it's only going to get worse because, you know, you've got more and more states uh, legalizing marijuana for recreational purposes. And um, I don't have the piece in front of me, uh, but... They are, uh, and they meaning the, 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 the powers that be, they, they say, <laughs> they do this, they do that. Uh, they're, next year, I believe by the middle of next year, they're going to roll out what they believe to be an accurate breathalyzer test machine for marijuana use. To see if uh, they're going to have to do something you know for uh proving that someone is under the the influence of marijuana while driving a vehicle so they they probably rushed this machine through testing it's, oh yeah it works and they're gonna probably bust a whole bunch of people that don't even smoke weed you've seen it in georgia where they've got cops who they say have been specially trained to spot people who or under the influence of drugs and they don't really have any proof other than, well, I was trained and uh, I believe you're under the influence of drugs and, and they throw them in jail and then come to find out they've never used drugs. They, they test negative for marijuana and the cops just double down and said, we're going to continue to use these methods because they've been trained and, and it works. Well, it's horse shit. Yeah. Well, obviously, accuracy is not an issue for them. They don't care about it. Right. And it's going to cost a fortune. You know, as this spreads, you're going to have lawyers that are just lining up to sue these states for this. And this has been a huge cash cow for them, so they want to keep that going. Why do they care if their equipment works or not? But I think this is going to come bite them in the ass, so then guess who gets to pay for their mess? Yeah, and then you're, you're seeing... I, I truly believe this is one of the reasons why there's been this war on Uber and Lyft. They have really taken a sizable dent uh, in the, as far as uh, the, the revenue that is being generated by drunk driving arrests. I mean, why people have changed their attitudes when it comes to drinking and driving, but also, wow, uh, people look at their phone and say, for the cost of one drink, I can have someone take me home. I, I, I not to now I'm sounding like fringe media, but uh, honestly, uh, I would love to see the statistics. I would love to see how much uh, drunk driving has been affected by Uber um, and changing attitudes. And you're seeing uh push a push by many states to try to lower the drinking age or not lower the drinking age, lower the blood alcohol level um, to what 0.05 um, to make that illegal. And now you're getting to the point where you can't even have a beer with dinner with and get it pulled over without being uh, hassled. So uh, why is that happening? I'm super paranoid of that. I don't do it. I don't play around with it at all. Right. To your point, I, I will Uber. I'm like, I'm just going out to dinner and going to have a glass or two of wine. I'm not, why we're on the risk of like $10,000 fine, all kinds of attorney fees. In Pennsylvania, they make you go through like Alcoholics Anonymous of some sort. Like you got to go to alcohol rehab. It, it, and then you got to pay for all that. You have to go to a counselor. I mean, you're talking about a ton of money. And how ridiculous is that? You say, and, and listen, I'm not saying that you should be able to drink and drive. You shouldn't drink and drive. Uh, well, I look I, f I, to me, um, in an ideal situation, in an ideal society, uh, if you cause an accident, then you do an investigation. And then if you're drunk, then there are consequences, but just, you know, 
having people patrol and, and, and do uh, sobriety checkpoints, I think is obscene, but, um, having, having said that, uh, and you veered me off. I, I don't remember what I was going to say because I'm getting old Tracy and I drink well, a lot. Your point. It's like, uh, you know, if you commit a crime, that's one thing, but if you commit a crime using a gun that ups the punishment. Yeah. So it can't, go that route instead of just saying oh let's just randomly screen people and stop them it's just i don't know about the, i don't i don't know what time period like the 70s 60s 70s before seat belts <laughs> like how many times have you heard stories that oh somebody got pulled over drunk and the, the cops just drove them home yeah took their so beer get you off the road i'll take your beer but I would love to see how much uh, revenue has gone down because of changing attitudes in uh, drinking and driving and the popularity of Lyft and Uber. How if it's really taken a dent or if it's really put a, a, a man, I, I'm just totally foggy in the port today, Tracy. <laughs> it's affecting their budgets. It's taking money away from them. Um, and it uh, they have to find ways to get that money back so now we're going to do the marijuana test and we'll see how accurate that is i bet it's not going to be very accurate but it won't matter because they need the revenue so they're just going to push ahead Mm -hmm. and then what are they going to do when nobody drives a car anymore (laughs) right yep well just a simple search for dui or s is down uber lyft I, i found a ton of articles so it looks like it's a thing, which makes sense. Yeah. Uh, they get their, they dip their toe in and they, they, they start taking money and then they have to expand their power to get more money. I mean, I brought it up on several occasions when it comes to seatbelt laws and growing up in the state of Michigan in the early eighties, they passed a seatbelt law and when they got it passed, um, when they sold it to, People in Michigan, they said, listen, we're never going to be able to pull you over just because you're not wearing your seatbelt. It'll be a secondary violation. We pull you over for speeding. Uh, Then we realize you're not wearing your seatbelt. Then we'll give you a ticket. And then they started getting that sweet, sweet seatbelt ticket revenue. And it helped with the budgets. And then all of a sudden, he's like, you know, we aren't saving enough lives, Tracy. You you really should be wearing your seatbelt. So we're going to... Make to where we can pull you over for not wearing your seatbelt. And it goes from there to you've got cops on an overpass with binoculars looking at people as they drive to see if they're wearing their seatbelt. Power expands. Um, they want, they get addicted to that revenue and it becomes more and more intrusive. So uh, I know that sounds conspiratorial, but that's just the nature of government. It's true. I mean, mm-hmm. I think I told you this. I dug through the budget of the city of Reading. Mm-hmm. They've mm-hmm. subsequently changed how they put it out. They used to put out um, an entire Excel spreadsheet. And I don't know how much time you spend it with Excel spreadsheets, fingers. But I try to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> I work with them all the time. So I was looking at it, and I'm like, huh, this is pretty short. It's only like one scroll, and I'm through the whole thing. And then I notice the way that it's set up, the uh, columns on the left-hand side that run the whole length of it are numbered, starting at one, obviously, mm-hmm. and then columns go across or A, whatever. So I noticed that it jumps from like 70 to 500 something. So what they've done is hidden a bunch of it. So I highlight it and I click unhide, and all of a sudden there's all this other data that's there, and you can, you know, they weren't trying to 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 keep it from everybody. Obviously, I mean it's in this data sheet that would be their argument, but they did hide it. <laughs> start reading through that and it's talking about where they expect to get revenue and now mind you this is one of the poorest cities in the entire country they have a line in their budget every year for what they expect to get from traffic fines other kinds of fines all the stuff five million dollars a year and they've already spent it mind you i mean it's accounted for they're gonna they've got a place for that money to go but they're just counting on that so they've given these guys that becomes the quota you guys have to come back to us with this much money. And then they and, deny that there are quotas. Oh, of course. 
but it's in the budget. I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I got pulled That's like out of PDF, and I can't find that stuff anymore. I got pulled over in my community, and uh, a cop had me going seven over. I couldn't believe he got pulled over, and he took my license. He came back and he said, "Listen, um, it." If I were to write you a ticket, it was it was a ridiculous amount of money. It was for going seven over. It was like a hundred and thirty, hundred and forty dollars. Uh, but he he said uh, our policy this week we have to write a ticket for everyone we pull over if we believe that there was a moving violation. He said I've looked at your record and you don't you're not a speeder. You're not a habitual speeder. He said I don't want to put this on your record. He goes I'm going to ticket you for not wearing your seatbelt. It's a it's a twenty five dollar ticket. I have to write you up for something. And I, I, I was so angry that I had to basically thank this police officer for cutting me a break. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I was grateful that he did do that because he didn't have to. But right. the fact that I'm in a position that I have to thank him for writing me a ticket. <laughs> yeah. It was ridiculous. You know what else is ridiculous? We've been doing this for uh, an hour, but and I feel like it, we, we need to stop because um, if you're watching this podcast on YouTube or BitChute, uh, the sun is about ready to go into my face because I still don't have window coverings yet in the studio. <laughs> so you have anything else, Tracy? I just wanted to give everybody a little update on my um, gym situation. Oh, yes, please do. For, so, for, Philip, for, for if people who did not listen to the show last week, Tracy got into it with a woman on her cell phone while she was on the. Well, I didn't get into it with her, but well, I mean, I did shout. Yeah. So there was a, there's a, um, I go to the gym in my apartment complex. So these are my neighbors. Mm -hmm. So I have a hard time knowing how to deal with this kind of stuff. And there's a woman that's in there, normally around the same time I am. Uh, English is not her first language. I don't know what is, but it sounds really squawky to me. <laughs> and she likes to talk on her cell phone. She's got a high pitch voice, so which carries very well. So I'll be in there. I've got my AirPods in. I've got my whatever I'm watching cranked as high as it'll go, and I can still hear her over it. So last weekend I was in there. It was just she and I, and she's yapping away. And I first stopped her, and I said, excuse me. Like, I got her attention. Can you keep your voice down? That worked for about five minutes, and then it started again. So I ended up yelling out a bunch of expletives, which she didn't seem to react to at all. But I'm now of the mind that she did hear me because every day that I was in there this week when she was also in there, she did not talk on her cell phone. Oh, there you go. She had it with her, and I know she was tempted to do it. I could see like her checking the phone and... <laughs> she stayed off the cell phone. So I think that that situation has resolved itself. You didn't have to get the authorities involved. No. So are we I not don't. going to come up with our signs? <laughs> we can still do our signs. Or Sabo. Sabo, right? Sabo ask signs. Where we're just, yeah, yes. do that. Because people aren't wiping down the machines in my gym and it's gross. Ugh. Sick, sick, sick. Um, well, you can catch the Enough Already podcast on Apple Podcasts and where all good podcasts are sold. If you are a Google person, there's Stitcher, TuneIn. I believe we're on Google Play, right, Tracy? That's true. And, of course, if you want to watch us do the podcast, check out YouTube and BitChute. And right now you can see the sun uh, really coming into my shot big time. The lighting is fantastic. we got a great budget here at Enough Already. Uh, remember, you can find the Enough Already podcast um, on Facebook, facebook.com slash Enough Already podcast. And, of course, we have a website, enoughalready.us, where Tracy puts the show notes up there, and you can catch the, the podcast there as well. Final thoughts, Tracy? I've, I've got nothing. Ditto. All right. She's Tracy. I'm Fingers. We'll be back soon with an all-new Enough Already.